So if you study the mathematical forms that describe the physical world, you've gained a foothold in the eternal spiritual realm. And those mathematical forms are then another step towards understanding these higher order of, of archetypes, which Carl Jung talked about in the collective unconscious mind. The goal was to gradually open the eye of the soul by turning it inward away from the empirically observable world. And then you would open that to this idea of the good, this, which is the archetype of the sun, the supremely brilliant source of intelligence and truth. That explains that intensity of why are they so intent on studying these mathematical forms. One of the reasons was because to do so is to gain eternal life, to escape the cycle of reincarnation in Plato's terminology and see God. Welcome back to the transmission, my friends. I just had a touch of a giggle before hitting record just now because if I had to draw up a mind meld that would somehow encapsulate all of the regular wonder dips, all of the regular fascinations that we address um, on this show, this really might be it because this one squares the circle between around on uh, it. It makes a nice conversational mandala of ancient esoteric wisdom, the psycho-spiritual philosophy of Carl Jung, consciousness, and theoretical physics, holographic string theory in particular. And how do we unite said topics, you ask? Of course, that is far beyond the scope of this introductory ramble, but it is squarely in the scope of the meteor portion of this mind meld as well as the book Psyche and Singularity by our guest in this one, Timothy Owen Desmond. He's an author, philosopher, and professor, and he's also got a course out called Immortality and the Unreality of Death, A Hero's Journey Through Philosophy, Psychology, and Physics, which you can partake in via his site. A link for that will be in the description, of course, as will all of Tim's goods for that matter. Same for Third Eye Drops. Speaking of which, do me a favor, presently, tickle that algorithm with a like, a sub, a comment, a share. It truly is of the utmost importance. And I must also remind you, we've got over 300 mind melds that are audio only with hundreds of brilliant beings. You can only hear those wherever you listen to podcasts, Apple, Spotify, wherever that may be. Do subscribe to Third Eye Drops. And if you'd like to go deeper, support more directly, get in on monthly live Wonder Gym hangs, join up at patreon.com forward slash third eye drops. Speaking of which, we've got a hang coming up in just a couple of days with my dear friend Molly Adler of the Back from the Borderline podcast. Hope you can join us for that. Uh, you can also hear the replay after the fact. If you join up on Patreon, you also get rewards like stickers, pins, shirts, and more, depending on your pledge level. All of it at patreon.com forward slash third eye drops. Hope to riff with you there in the patron discord. But for now, let's meld minds with the wise, wonderful, whimsical Timothy Desmond. Welcome, my friend. As I was just beginning to butter you up with in the pre-talk, I, I really, I really do think that you synthesize a lot of the different elements that I'm interested in, that the audience is interested in. You know, you've got the sort of cosmological math mysticism of, of Platonism going on. You've got the the psycho-mystical, uh, psychological lens that Jung wields so deftly. And you combine them both together in a way that's really, really interesting to me. Um, even though I've just started diving into your work, I'm sure we're gonna be able to do parts two, three, et cetera, but I'm excited, my friend. So I'm glad you're here. Yeah, thanks. I'm excited too. I was looking at your videos last night and the night before, and, uh, I said, oh, wow, this guy's right on the same lane as I'm in. So this will be fun. Yeah. Um, you know, I can't help but think about, um, somebody else who's, not not coming at this from the exact same angle of attack as you, but it seems like it's beginning to land in some some similar areas, albeit maybe through a, kind of a different set of rationale. But um, are you familiar with uh, Dr. Do Donald Hoffman's work at all? I've heard the name, um, but I forget exactly what his specialty is. Okay, well, I, 
I don't know if I should. I don't know if I should hijack the conversation by going right into him at, at the outset. But maybe, maybe that's maybe that's somewhere that we'll um, eventually get. But um, in terms of your work, as I just said, you basically in you basically find a way to synthesize Jung and Plato, Vedantic philosophy. A lot of these things that I think people, you know, who are interested in, I guess what, what we could broadly call like idealism. Um, and trying to sort of square the circle between spirituality and psyche and, you know, the world, the human condition, what what's really going on, and being able to summarize all of that in a way that harmonizes with what science is telling us. And you've got a really ambitious, kind of elegant argument for doing that. And uh, how do you usually start when you when you when you bring this up? Because there's there's a few different ways that that I can think of to start. But usually I start with the the uh, Carl Jung Wolfgang Pauli conjecture. Perfect. How Jung wor- worked with yeah, the other the well, co-founder of the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics, Wolfgang Pauli, Nobel Prize winner, and he worked with Jung for over twenty five years until his death in nineteen fifty eight, Pauli's yep. death. And the main thing they were looking for is a mirror symmetry or parallels between the laws of physics and the laws of psychology. Right. Because their theory was underlying mind and matter is a more absolute level, they call the psychoid level, and the archetypes of the collective unconscious are psychoid. They're not mental or physical, they're the origin of both. And because they're the origin of both, the laws of physics and psychology should mirror each other. And based on that, I look for parallels between physics and psychology like they did. But they were obviously looking at the parallels between Jung's platonic archetypal psychology, because by the time he's working with Pauli, they both admitted, this is just a restatement of Plato's theory of the absolute ideas. Jung evolved over time. And by the end, he was saying, this is just a restatement of the platonic eidos. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I've, abused so, that quote. I've abused that quote a few times myself. Yeah, well, it helps because then now you've you've inherited the entire two dozen centuries of academic <laughs> history of philosophy. Right. So they focused on relativity theory, special in general, and obviously quantum mechanics. But then the big story of 20th century physics was how those two, general relativity, the theory of gravity, Einstein's theory of gravity, and quantum mechanics, they don't blend. You would think there's one law of physics because there's one universe, or if there's a multiverse, at any rate, there's one cosmos. So there should be one law of physics that applies all the way up and all the way down, but you have to have quantum mechanics for small things. You have to have general relativity for very massive things. So the holy grail of physics was to unite these two. Mm -hmm. And that was achieved mathematically in the early 1990s by Leonard Susskind and Harard Tehuft, the latter of which is another Nobel Prize winner. And the former is now a retired Stanford physicist. But they successfully united these two theories mathematically. They couldn't empirically confirm it because the strings of string theory are down at the Planck scale. They're too small to see. But from their description of what they came up with, this holographic principle, uh, the parallels with Carl Jung's psychology really popped out, especially his near-death experience of the cosmic horizon, Mm. which uh, I first stumbled upon Susskind's. I, I focus on Leonard Susskind because he put out two books, The Black Hole War and The Cosmic Landscape, and he takes a hard line atheistic perspective in those books and uh, i saw his interview with morgan freeman through the wormhole with morgan freeman back in 2010 and he described his theory about how information is conserved on the event horizon of a black hole and the horizon of the cosmos and that triggered my memory earlier that year of of reading carl jung's memories dreams reflections and his near-death experience a real perfect point for point parallel between this holographic string theory of information conservation at the horizon of the cosmos and Carl Jung's near-death experience. So once I saw that, I, I dove in deeper and uh, 
everything just started to fall into place in a really yeah. neat way. Yeah, yeah. And, and I've been sort of grokking that over listening to your interviews um, a couple of times now. And un unfortunately, we planned this so quickly that I didn't get a chance to completely, you know, go through your book. But um, I, I've, I've more or less downloaded the nucleus of everything you just said. But I think let's, um, for people that may not be as privileged with some of this, these uh, conceptual underpinnings, let's sort of unpack how a lot of these ideas inform one another. And what you alluded to already so beautifully is that in that statement of Jung's, where he said that archetypes are essentially a restatement of the Platonic eidos, like this is a humongous statement here, because what he's saying is that there's a more fundamental layer of reality that consists of these values, basically, you know, it, it's hard to know what word to use here because we're talking about something that is both fundamentally intertwined with reality as we experience it, yet is super normal to that reality somehow. And in some very real way, kind of projects this reality from itself or this reality somehow reflects in, in its shadow or something. Um, so we don't live in this, you know, random nominalistic universe, essentially, it is, is one of the, the core sort of ontological statements being made here. So what kind of universe do we live in? We live in a universe of meaning, of order, of relationships, of psyche, where these are really ontologically real fundamental elements of reality. They're not they're not epiphenomenons of a complicated neuronally dense brain. Like this is the substance of of reality. Um so this is something that Jung and Plato were united on in a, in a really important way. And this in a lot of ways flies in the face of the the common materialistic reductionist worldview today, right? Like we we live in a in a world that says just the opposite, according to what we're all sort of programmed to believe, unless we, you know, uh, accepted the sort of standard religious explanation of things or something like that. Um, otherwise, you've got to go hunting for what now have become these more esoteric ways of looking at reality, like Jung is presenting to us or like Plato is presenting to us. So, so that's kind of key feature number one. Let, and let's talk a little bit about, you know, what like what Jung's contribution was because you know and I know that other than restating what Plato was stating in in psychological terms, he's adding a lot here and and part part of what he's adding is that he really has this twentieth century language of psychology and and science to contribute to what Plato was saying. And then combining his intellect with Wolfgang Pauli, who ends up winning, you know, um, uh, a Nobel Prize for his foundational work in, in quantum physics. Now you have these two minds coming together, trying to, you know, square the circle of of reality and how it seems to be, you know, dualistic. Like we we have this thing called psyche that we're all in, but we can't detect that we don't really know what it is or where it is or how it's working. And then we have the material reality. How do we square that circle? Um, and I guess we should mention too, that the first thing that really drove them to want to do this was the strangeness of synchronicity. And th these, these seem, these moments where seemingly the, the, you know, the fact that my mind, you know, I'm looking at the lens cap of my camera right now. I cannot make that thing move with my mind. I cannot influence that thing with my mind. Yet we've all had. Were, you're, you're spoon, <laughs> I thought you were spoon boy. This is only this is only for, <laughs> yeah. this is only for patrons that you and I will do the workshop on the telekinesis later. Um, <laughs> but um, yet we do. You know, if you if my comments are in any indication, at least everybody has troubling synchronicities or, or crazy synchronicities, you know, these meaningful coincidences where um, reality almost seems like it's conspiring to to show you that it's pulling a rabbit out of your hat that you're like at the center of. Um, and there are, you know, famous examples of this from from Jung. I've, I've talked about the Mad Nauseam, um, famous examples, in, to me at least, in my own life. 
I'm, you know, we just had a funny synchronicity yesterday that I emailed you about. Um, yeah. and, 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 and then you had one kind of piggybacking off of that. And maybe we can tell that story later, but I've been blabbering on and on. Um, but let's get, so getting back to Paulie and Jung, let's say a little bit of more, a little bit more about why their collaboration was so important and then what they, where they kind of landed, but what questions were still open, um, at the end of their time, because just like uh, Plato didn't have a lot of the language they were using, they still lacked a lot of the knowledge that we now have from physics, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the Well, to put this in a little bit of a context, you mentioned the shadow. I think one thing that we should, we should refresh our minds on is how Plato set up the whole field of mathematical physics and astronomy yeah, in the Republic, especially when he was trying to develop the curriculum for the ideal philosopher, the philosopher King for the ideally just society. And uh, the divided line analogy, I think is the easiest way to describe what he was saying. And then he expanded on that in the famous cave allegory, mm -hmm. but he said, or Plato depicted Socrates saying, that if we imagine reality as a line divided in two unequal sections, one bigger and one smaller, and then divide each of those segments by the same proportion, then the bottom of the line, which is the smallest realm, he says it would be two-dimensional shadows and mirror reflections of the next segment up on the divided line, which is three-dimensional objects. And that's the totality of the material world that you can see and taste and empirically observe. Then the other two segments constitute the eternal intelligible world that you can't see, but you can intuit or you can understand with your reason. And the bottom level of that is the mathematical forms that describe the three-dimensional objects in the visible world. And those three-dimensional objects are like shadows or mirror reflections of this of these mathematical forms, which are the lowest level of the eternal world. And then those mathematical forms, which would be the laws of physics, the laws of astronomy and music, especially Plato pointed to, yeah. they are like mirror reflections of the fourth segment, the highest level of the spiritual world, these archetypal forms, like the idea of justice, the idea of beauty, the idea of truth, but also the idea of tree, the idea of human, all the, all the archetypes. And then at the very top of that segment is the idea of the good, which is the source of all of the archetypes or the absolute ideas, which are in turn the source of all of the material forms. So the goal was to gradually open the eye of the soul by turning it inward, away from the empirically observable world inside. Mm -hmm. And then you would open that to this idea of the good, this, which is the archetype of the sun, the supremely brilliant source of intelligence and truth. So if you study the mathematical forms that describe the physical world, you've gained a foothold in the eternal spiritual realm. And those mathematical forms are then another step towards understanding these higher order of, of archetypes, which Carl Jung talked about in the collective unconscious mind. Yeah. So that explains the intensity with which, especially in the Platonic tradition, which is mainly the Western tradition, at least through the Renaissance, although, you know, the Muslims and the Indians were certainly no slouches in the mathematical realm and in astronomy, right. but that intensity of why are they so intent on studying these mathematical forms and coming up with all, all of these ridiculously difficult to understand descriptions, it's one of the reasons was because to do so is to gain eternal life to escape the cycle of reincarnation in Plato's terminology and see God. Mm -hmm. So in the, mm -hmm. in the middle ages, St. Augustine, he just said, okay, the idea of the good is God. The ideas that are in the idea of the good are ideas in the mind of God. So it's a religious quest, a spiritual quest. Yeah. Yep. And I believe that it, with this holographic string theory, combining general relativity and quantum mechanics, we have come full circle back to the original paradigm that Plato spelled out in a rudimentary form as a blueprint for what 
future mathematical astronomers should strive for. And the great irony there is Susskind at least presents it as the evidence against everything Plato stood for. <laughs> and uh, one, one maxim or aphorism I wrote is that irony is the fingerprint of God. Ooh, like at, I like, like at a crime scene. <laughs> and there's, it's one of the most great historical ironies is that Leonard Susskind presents this as the anti-Platonic <laughs> cosmology. Right. Like one of his books, the, the Cosmic Landscape is String Theory and the Illusion of Intelligent Design is the subtitle. <laughs> yeah, right. And uh, so uh, I hope that answered the question. That's, I mean, well, that was just putting a context for for the yeah. conversation to come. Yeah, yeah. But I'll let I'll let you inter interject something if you need to here. Yeah, all, all that's really all that is really good context. And and just to you know throw a little more fuel on this fire, it does seem like the universe. You know, look at the world with your senses. I think mo I think most people, and and we can just take you know the sort of balance of ancient wisdom <laughs> on this that everybody seemed to think that we lived in in some sort of intelligent ensouled reality that had order built into it you know you, then the scientific rev resolution revolution comes we begin to reduce reality down into its constituent parts we find that there is no soul there is no ghost in the machine you know therefore you know now now we've determined that this really is false there there is no spirit there is no soul supposedly however as physics goes on it seems like nature just continues to to just obviously scream at us that this is anything but random you know we we live in what what today we would call a fine-tuned universe where all of the fundamental laws in physics are in very narrow necessary proportions to one another i talked about this recently with uh the philosopher philip goff who's a, a panpsychist philosopher um but if you don't want to believe that, you don't want to believe what what he's saying, um, what what Todd is saying here. You've got to do some weird contortions. You you've got to believe in things or posit things that to me seem more far fetched than just looking at the universe that we live in. You know, start talking about things like multiverses and um, you know this I, like essentially the idea that we just happen to live in the one universe out of almost infinite that wasn't the one failed universe or or whatever so given that it starts to become clear at least the evidence to me at least let, let's just put it this way seems to point to the fact that plato was on to something jung was on to something and i want to have a quick sidebar here because i always love to get the opinion of people smarter than me on, on questions like this given that plato in his time, had very limited tools by scientific standards. You know, they they did have Euclidean geometry. They had, you know, they had math. They had um, measurement tools, of course. They probably knew a lot about, like, the proportions of the Earth and the solar system and stuff like that. We can see it, you know, encoded in buildings and the, from from well before his time, even. So that begs the question, what was their knowledge acquisition method, do you think? How, how do you think Platonists, you know, um, we'll probably get into the uh, into Vedantic philosophy a little bit later, considering that's part of um, your work as well. But how, how do you think they were acquiring this knowledge and, and how are they landing on these really seemingly potent truths that do at least to a large extent seem to harmonize with the actual nature of reality in a in a demonstrably scientifically relevant way well one way that i can say confidently is through near-death experiences um like the one plato talked about or had Socrates talk about at the end of the Republic, the myth of Ur. Yeah, yeah. Also in the Phaedrus or the Phaedrus. I've been saying Phaedrus for decades, and then I heard someone say Phaedrus. I said, oh, great. And is it Phaedo or is it Phaedo? Right, I, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that pesky AE thing that doesn't exist anymore. 
Right. So at any rate, I, I'll just go with what I've been saying, even if it's wrong and people can correct me. Um, in the in the Phaedrus especially, he very clearly says that the absolute ideas are specifically out at the horizon of the cosmos, the outermost sphere mm-hmm. where you can go when you die. The same thing in the myth of Ur. The soldier named Ur, he woke up on his own funeral pyre and he recalled his journey to the afterlife. So if that is where the absolute archetypal ideas are, and they are the and the shadows of them are the mathematical forms, which describe the three-dimensional physical objects in the temporal, empirically observable world, that's one avenue towards this kind of knowledge. It's eyewitness account of a disembodied psyche in between incarnations. And then there's the question of, you know, uh, Socrates talks about the Egyptians. Yeah. I believe that's the Timaeus where. Yeah. 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 They're saying the Egyptian was talking to the Athenian. Oh, you, you're like children. Mm -hmm. You're as old as us, but every time a catastrophe happens, you lose all your knowledge, whereas ours is recorded. Yeah. So potentially more ancient civilizations could have come to this level of mathematical and scientific understanding. And it was passed down through some kind of mystery tradition. Yeah. That's a possibility. Um, but definitely the near death experience direct encounters with this horizon of the cosmos, which is the big connection between Leonard Susskind's holographic string theory and Plato that according to string theory, the past, the present and the future of the entire universe, all of the information describing the entire temporal trajectory of the universe is located at each point of this encompassing sphere. And it radiates in from there on these fundamental elastic threads of energy. And that's what Plato was saying. The material world is the projection like a dream or a shadow of these absolute ideas, all of which exist at the horizon of the cosmos. So the mathematical tradition of mathematical astronomy stemming from Plato's academy came back to that fundamental framework. And for me, that's just too perfect to be yeah. a coincidence or an accident. And, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. So, it's wild so stuff. At any rate, to, to answer your question definitively, I would say at least there's near-death experiences. And, yeah. and Socrates himself recalled, you know, Socrates is famous for saying, oh, I'm wise because I know that I don't know. <laughs> But then in the Phaedrus, he recalled his past life and following the train of a god. And he described how, you know, the soul, the psyche rides the chariot with the winged horses. Yeah. So um, if that's the collective unconscious mind, then that's always accessible to any psyche anywhere at any time. Yeah, and the Phaedrus in and of itself is a really interesting dialogue because to uh, to piggyback off of what you were saying, there's this analogy where he's talking about the soul as if it's this um, chariot driven by two horses. And the two horses are supposed to be emblematic of different sort of core faculties of the human soul or psyche. And getting control of those horses is essentially what he's telling you that your job as someone who wants to seek wisdom or be a philosopher must do if you want to arrive at these higher truths. And you can sort of take it at that sort of intellect, in indirect level of allegory, or you can, and some people use these more esoteric hermeneutics on this as a sort of basic um, recipe for gaining this knowledge for yourself like actually being able to succeed in taking the psyche to a higher plane of existence, like into this noetic realm. And how do you do that? You have to, you know, so I said the the two horses are emblematic of these faculties of the human soul. And so is the chariot, I guess I should say. So it's like the chariot itself is supposed to be your logos, like your highest possible faculty. The logos is supposed to be controlling or, or demonstrating as much control as possible over the two horses. One horse is a good horse. It's a passionate horse. It wants to serve the master. The other horse is not such a good horse. It's, it has its own ideas. It wants to like, you know, it gets distracted constantly. It, it wants to, you know, whatever. You've got to 
be the charioteer and the balancer of those horses. And by the way, this is supposed to be map right onto Plato's idea of the tripartite soul with Eros, Thymos, and Logos. Eros is the bad horse that's constantly getting distracted and it's like stuck in its sort of animal desire um, state. Thymos is the passionate side and then, you know, Logos is at the top, ideally steering the whole thing. And if your Eros is out of control, you're never going to make it to those higher levels of understanding. It's like, you, you know, and anybody can see this in trying to acquire knowledge, right? There's that struggle. You, you want to give up. You want to be like, I'm not smart enough to do this. But if you keep at it, you, you arrive at this new level of understanding. But I, I do think it goes deeper than that because returning to the divided line, that very top kind of knowledge is like this noesis is, is what I don't, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly either, piggybacking on the on the Greek pronunciation uh, conversation. But to my memory, he specifically locates this above empirical knowing, above like mathematical knowing and number crunching. So even though that is a high kind of knowing in, in Plato's paradigm, there's a yet higher kind of knowing that leads me to believe that I, I totally have to agree with you that I think this is a kind of knowing you only get through apophatic, ecstatic, mind-altered experience. When you're directly experiencing the mystery, and in many ways, I think Plato's Republic, you know, a lot of his dialogues are essentially preparation so that when you enter whatever that realm is through whatever initiations or mechanisms they had at their disposal, you actually could take something of value back because if you're going to go into that realm as a non-philosopher, um, and I'm saying this as in a like platonic definition of philosopher, like not academic philosopher today, of course, but you know this is someone who's tuned their mind and body and soul to to receive this higher wisdom. Yeah, it's it seems like that's they're all but telling you like if you want to experience these realities for yourself you want to enter this realm of noesis, you've got to, A, figure out how to get there, like whatever the golden ticket they were using was, um, <laughs> and B, like have the philosophical and intellectual firepower to understand it so that it doesn't just completely overwhelm you. And I, I guess I'll just say I would, I would, I would give pretty much anything to know the full extent of what was going on in Plato's Academy uh, as far as that goes. Right. Um, you know, I've heard plenty of theories about how they were taking hallucinogenic trips. Uh, so that's totally conceivable. The mystery traditions, I yeah. think devotional service, an attitude of devotional service to the God is a key aspect of getting the you know the word that was popping into my mind that I'm trying not to say for some reason is transmission. Mm. I know that you call it yours transmission. Yeah, I often here. do. Yeah, yeah. But to, to serve the God with a spirit of love, like I believe Socrates was doing, he, he claimed to be doing that. That was why he walked around barefoot through the streets of Athens his whole life. Is the element i think that's the final ingredient to really get the highest levels of knowledge to surrender yourself to the supreme soul or the idea of the good because we are a part and parcel of the idea of the good all of the knowledge is there socrates says i don't teach anybody anything i'm a midwife i bring out the knowledge that you forgot you forgot everything in your past life but it's not the knowledge that you learned laboriously in your past life that you're after. You're after the eternal archetypal forms of knowledge of which the soul is made. And mathematical study of nature is one great way to advance up the ladder towards, you know, opening the eye of the soul to the idea of the good. But to do that in a spirit of loving service to the supreme soul, I think that's the key ingredient that is an accelerant to the whole process. And yeah. that even, even if you don't study the math, which is a thing I'm saying for my own benefit, because I haven't gone beyond 10th grade math, whatever you needed to take the GRE is what, as far as I got, um, the knowledge is there. So you don't need to learn anything. You just need to uncover the knowledge and then, and the, 
cooperation of the supreme being can on just take the scales off of your eyes and then you can just see i think there's i'm sure there's been illiterate people who couldn't read right. or write who had full knowledge of reality just by looking at their own soul and and um so that's that's just one method but for the rest of us this careful methodical mathematical study of the cosmos is also there and plus it helps even if you've had some kind of a of an epiphany then in later moments in life you might start to question yourself well then you can back it up with this deliberate rational methodical study of nature and the the two work hand in hand yeah 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 reiterating what we were saying earlier that that's one of the things i love about this is that plato socrates they encourage you to investigate nature math what's going on in the world to the deepest level that you're able to to find that it can comports with this, that it harmonizes with this. And, and there's a lot of religious traditions that encourage you to do just the opposite. It's like, no, look past that. That, that. That's all an illusion. What's real is God or what's real in the new age sense is like your mind, you can manifest whatever you want. It doesn't, you know, whatever. And that kind of stuff always just set, sets, sends up so many red flags to me. Like it just, it's essentially saying like, let me control you without, letting me without me having to explain how i'm controlling you like just just give up your your rational <clears throat> mind and your logos to me and believe what i'm saying and yeah that it's just so rampant and pernicious these days that i can't talk about it enough but anyway <laughs> returning back to jung now this near death experience he has is really key to unifying this whole idea um it's a really interesting story. I actually wasn't aware of Jung's near-death experience until like fairly recently. Um, so I was excited to see that it features prominently um, in your in your whole rap. But please recount that experience for everybody and and sort of knit that into to the larger scope of the conversation here. Yeah, sure. It was um, so. It's in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, which is his autobiography which came out a year after he died. So he died in 1961. So in 1962, that came out. And he recalls that in 1944, he broke his foot in Switzerland. And then he went to the hospital. And while he was in the hospital, he had a heart attack. And so what is he, 69? He was born in 1875. He's about 70 years old. And he said he felt his psyche rise out of his body above the hospital, then above the planet Earth, he said later, kind of analyzing how high up he would have had to have been in order to see what he saw, he, he measured it to be about a thousand miles above the planet Earth. He said he looked down, he saw the reddish sands of Arabia it was one of the details and the curvature of the Earth and the clouds beneath him. He was above Ceylon, south of India, overlooking India. And then he said he saw an enormous black boulder hollowed out into a temple, like the ones he'd seen in the Gulf of Bengal when he was in India. And it was the size of his house. So it's a house-sized boulder, and it's hollowed out into a temple. In the front antechamber was a black Hindu in a white robe sitting in the lotus posture. And behind him was a brilliantly lit room. He said it seemed to him as if the people to whom he belonged in reality were in that back room. And that if he could get in there, he would learn everything there was to know about everything that came before him. And I, I believe he was alluding to reincarnation and everything that would come after. All of his, yeah. the whole chain of his incarnations would be revealed. And as he approached the temple, he said he felt his whole life get ripped from him, torn from him painfully, and then given back simultaneously so that he had that typical near-death experience of the whole life review, the whole, your whole life flashes before your eyes. But as he was getting ready to enter the temple, the, the psychic form of his doctor, who he called Dr. H rose above the earth and said that he'd been delegated by the earth to bring Jung back. Like Jung had some more work to do on the earth. He wasn't allowed to leave yet. And then he woke up and then he said he felt horrible and depressed, especially at the approach of the gray morning with its box system, he said. Mm. And he's, 
he summarized it by saying that it seemed to him as if each of us in the three-dimensional world lives in our own little box of illusion, our own little cube of illusion, which is tethered to the horizon of the cosmos by a thread. That was the key parallel with string theory. Yeah. And he also had mystical experiences every night, starting around midnight for about an hour, where he would witness the archetypes of the collective unconscious. He, he mentioned specifically the marriage of Hera and Zeus. And he talks about the garden of pomegranates. And it was the most ecstatic and blissful experiences he'd ever had. And he also said it seemed to him as if the, the past, the present, and the future were interwoven and he was experiencing the cosmos as a whole and that it was an objective reality. It wasn't just a subjective illusion. So when you add up the initial near-death experience with these nightly mystical experiences that followed for three weeks, then you have all of these essential ingredients to find the parallel with holographic string theory which says that every bit of information from the past, present, and future of the material three-dimensional world is conserved at each point of this two-dimensional, perfectly flat sphere, the covering of a ball, of a three-dimensional ball, yeah. and that it radiates back in with the cosmic microwave background radiation, the echo of the Big Bang, on these elastic threads of energy to create the holographic illusion, which Susskind calls a cinematic hologram, of the three-dimensional world. And Brian Greene specifically compared Susskind's theory to Plato's cave allegory. Yeah. Which says that this whole world is like a shadow projection from the absolute ideas. He talks about how it seems to be kind of inverted because the reality is this two-dimensional sphere, whereas the three-dimensional reality is the shadow. In the cave allegory, the three-dimensional people are looking at the back wall of the cave and they're they believe they are their own two-dimensional shadows. And one way to counter that point is that from our perspective on Earth, the horizon of the cosmos appears to be a two-dimensional flat surface. But from the perspective of psyches who go there during near-death experiences, it's infinitely deep. It's the city of God. It's filled with the eternal forms of reality. Yeah. So that it's not this dimensional analogy where this three-dimensional world is less real than a two-dimensional surface, that two, it's just described as a two-dimensional surface, but it's really infinitely deep because it contains all of the information of the three-dimensional world. But, um, but that's Carl Jung's near-death experience. Yeah. And I had watched Leonard Susskind describe basically the same thing. And I already had Jung's near-death experience in my memory. And so when I heard Susskind say the same thing, it was July 4, 2010. I was like, oh man, that's a perfect point for point parallel right there. And then later I was reading, working on the dissertation that became my dissertation. And I was reading Carl Jung's letter to J.R. Smithies from Leap Day, February 29. We have a Leap Day coming up this year, 2024. Oh, yeah. Um, and he was talking about, you know, how come you can't measure psychic energy because E equals MC squared. So Jung, another important point, learned about relativity theory from Einstein himself from 1909 to 1913 in Switzerland. So he learned about quantum physics from Wolfgang Pauli, who developed quantum physics in Copenhagen with Heisenberg and, and Bohr. He yeah. learned about relativity theory from Einstein. So you can't get a more direct source That's of information. True. And um, so... Uh, Oh, shoot. What was I? What tangent was I going? On? Oh, yeah. The, the, the leap day letter to J.R. Smithies. Mm -hmm. So in the context of relativity theory, Jung's like, how come we can't measure psychic energy? If E equals MC squared and energy is mass times the speed of light squared, the units of energy and the units of mass can be converted if you multiply the units of mass times the speed of light squared, which implies there's so much energy and even a little bit of matter, which is why we have atomic bombs. Why can't we measure psychic energy? Because he's saying psychic, the psyche is its own thing. It's not a material byproduct. It is its own source of energy. Why can't we measure it? In previous letters, he said maybe because it's too small. Just like string theory can't measure strings because they're too small. The math indicates they're there, but we don't have the technology capable to measure something that small. So that was his first speculation. But in this leap day letter, he said maybe we can't measure it because it's infinite. And he got into the 
the language of relativity theory and, and it, if you could accelerate a massive object to the speed of light, it would disappear from space and time because of length contraction and time dilation, that's special relativity. And he talks about the elasticity of space and time and that's general relativity. And to just cut to the chase, his final sentence was, you know, he talked about highest intensity, maybe giving up extension in space by having more intensity. He talked about infinite intensity. And the concluding sentence was psyche equals highest intensity in the smallest space. So he had already mentioned earlier in the letter, the highest intensity would be infinite intensity. And he already talked about unextended, you know, reality. So the smallest space is zero volume. So the highest intensity or infinite density of matter in zero volume, that's a gravitational singularity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we have the horizon of the cosmos from his near-death experience. And then we have the central singularity from his leap day equation. And you put them together, and now you've got what I believe is a map of the psyche, which really matches well with uh, with Jung's and Pali's theory of the mandala image of the self archetype. The archetype of the self is like Plato's idea of the good, and it yeah. presents psyches with the images of mandala circles or spheres with a central point. So to just summarize this this uh, trail that I've gone down. I equate the central singularity with the conscious ego side of the self archetype. And I equate the, the horizon of the cosmos, where from our perspective on Earth, space time seems to be expanding away from us at the speed of light. I, I equate that with the collective unconscious pole of the archetype of the self. And then there's this relationship between the central point and the horizon, how they can flip into each other. Yeah. But, and each of us participates in that archetype of the self. And we're all one with that central singularity and the horizon of the cosmos. No matter where you go in the universe, you will perceive yourself as the central point of the field of light. There's another way Jung described it. The ego mm. is the central point of the field of light. Well, the field of light ends at the horizon of the cosmos. But at any rate, that the central point, the ego, the conscious aspect of the self, the horizon of the cosmos, the collective unconscious, that was, uh, that's with the two main pieces that fit, that fit together and everything else falls into place within that mandala structure. Yeah. That it's mind blowing stuff. And, and I'm, I'm still having trouble completely wrapping my mind around it, but it occurred to me too, while, while you were saying that, that that's yet another potential example of what you said earlier of the fingerprint of God being this being irony. It's like, you know, we're, we're simultaneously the the smallest and most negative volume i think as you put it or, uh, or zero vol volume zero volume yeah. and and also you know the in somehow entangled with with the totality of everything and in that non dualistic dyad i guess i'd call it um <laughs> you you have psyche somehow and while you were saying that it also occurred to me that when you see these sort of like for lack of a better term, Western, esoteric, Platonic, Aristotelian kind of uh, geocentric models of the of the um, solar system. You know, if, if you're looking at that today as something literal, you're like, oh, that's wrong. You know, the Earth's not at the center. But if you're looking at it in the way that you're saying and in the way that Jung is saying, where the psyche is is the object seemingly at the center then it makes complete sense. It's like the, the earth just becomes the archetype of the self at the center. And then you have all of these, you know, connecting archetypes leading up to the sphere of the fixed stars that, as they called it, where, you know, which is kind of synonymous with this noetic realm that we're talking about, but we don't have to get into the, the all of the, the Western, Western esoteric underpinnings there. Uh, but I think you just coined a term Wesoteric. Wesoteric, yeah. <laughs> the Western um, esoteric tradition. But, you know, it also, there, there's a passage in the Timaeus that reminds me of what you're saying, too, which, um, again, to refresh people's memory, is the dialogue that has to do with um, the or the metaphysical origins of the cosmos, essentially. And this idea of psyche potentially permeating everything, um, 
and and I need to actually check the the Greek here because in the translation it just says um it says soul. Um, but I think I was saying this before we, we were recording, is that they describe the soul as being comprised of the intermediate forms of self, being, and other. And soul is sort of the overlap of all of those things. So that right there, I mean, wrapping your mind around this idea of like capital S self, capital B being, and capital O other. So like the the archetypes of these concepts overlapping them with one another, you get soul. And not not only that, but in the Timaeus, they describe that the Demiurge, the craftsman, who by the way is not an evil, uh evil God, <laughs> as the as the as the the Gnostic worldview on that word has somehow completely tainted the word demiurge, unfortunately. But anyway, the Platonic Demiurge, the good Demiurge, the original Demiurge, that when it was crafting the cosmos, it stretched this over all of the cosmos. So there's actually this, it's not that you're like a being with a soul in you. It's that soul is a quality that is stretched across all of creation that you're, that you're in. So this is an, this is another interesting parallel to, to what you're talking about. I think, um, un, unsurprisingly that, that Plato seemed to have a similar understanding or, or came to a sim- similar metaphysical uh, conclusion somehow. Oh, um, yeah. In the, in the yeah. time as he specifically says that the Demiurge placed the soul in the central point and at each point of the encompassing sphere. Yes. And, and at all points in between, but the, they paint the picture of this perfect mandala in the center in this encompassing sphere, which he called the mother substance. And then it all points in between, which correlates with the gravitational singularity being like you were mentioning that this earth is the center, wherever you are, according to general relativity, you'll perceive yourself as the center of an expanding universe. Yeah. So that brings us back to the geocentric perspective that was discarded as primitive as we advanced. You know, it's better to look at yourself in, in the solar system model, the sun is the center. It's it makes it easier to understand and predict the patterns of the planets. But from a universal perspective, everyone will perceive themselves as the center. Right. I didn't want to go off, but this the Timaeus that's a big one I point to a lot. The model of the universe in the Timaeus is that there's the soul of the universe in the central point, which encompasses this mother substance, this encompassing sphere, and that the material reality radiates in from that mother substance. He doesn't mention any kind of strings in the Timaeus, but in the myth of Ur, each soul that's reincarnating goes out to the horizon of the cosmos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just thinking this. Yep, yep. Yeah, and the three fates, the three sister Mm -hmm. goddesses who are singing, attach each soul, each psyche to the thread of its destiny. And then they take that back to the central earth. So when you add up the Republic and the Phaedrus, where the archetypes are out, the absolute ideas are out at the horizon of the cosmos and the Timaeus, you, you add those three cosmologies together, which shaped the Western mind. And you have all the ingredients that Susskind came up with, with Herard de Hooft. It's just such a perfect, you know, all the ingredients are there. That and then you add in all these near death experiences, which continue to this day, yeah, which confirms that you know you can experience the past, present, and future if out at the horizon of the cosmos. So it just keeps being reiterated again and again. Yeah, it's it, it's really mind bending, fascinating stuff. Um, oh, we should. I wanted to unpack the mandala idea a little bit because some people may not be aware of how much of a focal point that was for Jung's philosophy in general. And speaking of, you know, time just sort of existing in in all points at once in a sort of, um, you know, at least in the more ideal noetic realm. And and this is, this is another piece of Plato's metaphysics. That's, that's interesting concepts like time and motion. These are concepts that only exist in the cosmos that we are in. And it's explicitly said by Plato that you know, like it, 
the realm of the forms is an unchanging realm. We live in a realm that is changing by virtue of the fact that we we have all of these other you know things that are are moving and they're coming into and out of being and they're in these cycles and stuff. In the in these noetic realms of forms that are you know would again be beyond the 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 horizon of the uh, of the cosmos is that how you're yeah. you're chosen okay um yeah. you you would eventually you know and, and again we should we should um emphasize that this isn't an, a statement about literal like flat you know like some kind of flat earth version of the cosmos where you're going to like get to the end of it and now like now you're in the noetic realm because you went far enough i i don't think anyway of course no. i could be wrong but um but it's it's something that's sort of <clears throat> We are self, and it, it's such a again, it's such a mind fuck because it's like we're self similar to it, like it it is more this than this, you know, it, it's more uh, this world than this world, but it's it's somehow unchanging, it's somehow more perfect, it's somehow more like not not in any kind of contradiction to itself. Whereas we perceive this world to be that way with like, you know, the problem of evil, things coming in and out of being, suffering, degradation, all these things. These are qualities that only exist, according to Plato, in in this realm. Um, but anyway, speaking of this idea of everything sort of existing at once and Jung's obsession with the mandala, you can see in the Red Book and in Jung's own art that he was very early on sort of obsessed with mandalas and like just these figures where there were like, there was a circle, there might be characters in the circle. There might be crosses in the circle. There might be shapes like stained glass looking things in the circle. But as time goes on and by the time you get to memories, dreams, refle- reflections, which as you point to is, you know, his sort of uh, memoir that was written close to the end of his life. He fully reflects on this obsession with the mandala and it's like in a in a sort of kind of postscript way and and shows how this idea sort of like matured as he gained understanding about um alchemy and gained understanding about eastern mysticism and you know vedantic yogic philosophy and stuff like that and i don't even know if he had the word i don't even know when the word mandala came into his vocabulary but if i had to guess he was probably making mandalas before he even knew the word mandala yeah, um, probably, and I mean, there there's so many instances instances of that in Jung's work, like alchemy in particular. There's very there's a lot of um, Red Book is pre his obsession with alchemy, um, and in some somewhere, um, it may actually be at the end of the Red Book where he says basically studying alchemy is what pulled him out of his <coughs> um, his. Um, confrontation with the unconscious and his whole multi-year period of constructing what became the red book and then his new obsession uh which i believe stemmed from him getting the book uh secret is it secret golden flower or of the golden flower yes it's, secrets of the golden flower i was just reading about that he did that he worked with someone else to translate yeah. the chinese text yes yeah so that was a chinese alchemical text and he was seeing you know he got this book from a friend i forget which friend it was um and he read this book and he's like, this is everything that I've been trying to be saying, or I've been trying to say, basically. And then he became obsessed with alchemy. But what's crazy is if you read the Red Book with an alchemical eye, the whole thing is extremely alchemical. So that this mandala example almost seems to be another uh, instance of that, of uh, kind of becoming obsessed with something and a mo- motif that you don't even really understand why you're obsessed with it. And I'm sure you've had this happen in your life. This has happened in my life with with feeling like ideas were sort of this seed that was just embedded somehow. And, and, and this is very platonic, I guess, because this evokes the sort of anamnesis. It's like something you already knew that that is slowly growing and blossoming, this understanding. And the mandala, you know, so this whole multi-minute ramble here is just to say that the mandala is this very <laughs> core idea to Jung about what the self is, what the capital S self is, what the process of individuation is, which is like exploring yeah. that mandala or exploring the the labyrinth within the mandala and getting to the center of it. So this so this is a really key key idea that we're that we're playing with here. Oh yeah, the mandala. He said 
in Memories, Dreams, Reflections. It was, I'm trying to remember the exact quote, but you said this was the greatest discovery of his life, that the mandala is the image of the self. Perhaps someone else knows more, but not I. That was, you know, he's like, this was it. It was 1916 that he first started drawing these mandalas in his midlife crisis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was watching your video about individuation last night, and you mentioned he had this midlife crisis. He he rejected Freud's invitation to become the heir apparent of Freud's materialistic psychology. He gave up his what professional academic position, yeah. and he started drawing mandalas. 1916 was the same year Carl Schwarzschild, who in December 22nd, 1915, provided Einstein with the first exact mathematical solutions for the gravitational field. Mm. So Einstein had approximate solutions. You know, I don't know. It's the math goes beyond me, but he helped Schwarzschild get that paper published. And then in February 1916, Schwarzschild put out another paper that Einstein dis- detested, which said, look, according to general relativity, if you had enough mass in a small enough space, a, a dense enough star, it would collapse into a point of infinite density and it would be surrounded by this perimeter where the tidal flow of space-time reaches the speed of light, which we now call the event horizon. So a black hole is a geometrically perfect mandala. Right. It's a literal mathematical point, a singularity, surrounded by a literal two-dimensional sphere, a perfectly flat, perfect sphere. It's not a physical thing. It's outside of space and time. And that, I think, is a nice coincidence. That was the same year Jung became <laughs> infatuated with mandalas. And this entire psyche equals singularity, translating Jung's own letter about what psychic energy is, indicates the psyche is a singularity, which always surrounds itself with this sphere, this either the event horizon of a black hole or in the case of the Big Bang singularity, which is exploding rather than contracting, it's the horizon of the cosmos where the fabric of space-time is expanding away from the center at the speed of light. And that creates the horizon of the cosmos. It's an inside-out event horizon. And we can get into the Susskind's theory of information conservation on the horizon, the event horizon of a black hole or the cosmic horizon. But when Jung came out and said, of all the great things that he's done, you know, coming up with the concept of the collective unconscious, basically translating Plato's philosophy into the language of clinical psychology with the addition of relativity theory and quantum physics that he learned from the founders of those theories, he said, of all the great things that he's done, the greatest, the biggest insight was that the mandala is the image of, a, of the self archetype. Wow. So it's definitely something that if you're going to study Jung, you would make that a centerpiece. And he said that these mandalas emerge from the self archetype to compensate a psyche who's pulled between opposing demands. In the book, Mm. Psyche and Singularity, I talk about how Susskind and Tehooft, especially Susskind, were having a nervous breakdown because Stephen Hawking, the late great Stephen Hawking, said that information is swallowed inside a black hole that violates this principle of information conservation. So they're thinking that the whole field of physics is collapsing into itself. And this was an enormous, enormously psychologically disturbing thing for Susskind. And according to Jung, if that's the case, you're going to be compensated with mandala imagery to help you unite these opposites. And the opposites that needed to be united were general relativity, the theory of the very massive, and quantum physics, the theory of the very tiny, universal opposites, and lo and behold, in perfect fulfillment of Jung's prediction, they were united, finally at last, in the geometrically perfect mandala of a black hole and the inside-out black hole of the universe. Susskind calls the universe an inside-out black hole, expanding from a singularity rather than contracting into one. So that was just another perfect mirror symmetry, and that's in the history of physics, the psychology of the physicists was perfectly validating everything Carl Jung was saying, and their physical conclusion, everything was being validated point after point, which was this great irony. I'm like, Leonard Susskind, there's no one, you 
above everyone else <laughs> have provided the best evidence to support scientifically Jung and Plato's theory of these eternal archetypes, and you do it explicitly under the sign of an atheist trying to dismantle that very worldview, which you supported better than anyone in history. What a beautiful irony. Yeah, this I, that idea of the universe is an, is essentially an inside out black hole that that so I, now now I'm going to tell the story of the synchronicity because this is like the perfect time to do it. <laughs> so so I was listening to one of your podcasts recently and you know I was thinking specifically about this idea of the universe being an inside out black hole and how you know the black hole is this like gigantic cosmic mandala that somehow sort of like squares this circle and <laughs> I was just thinking like, so the podcast ends, I'm at the gym. The gym is just like playing whatever random radio nonsense it's playing. <laughs> and the second I turn off my, or the the podcast ends, this song I haven't heard in like 20 years, this like pop R&B song is playing. And the lyrics go like, um, Never, ever, ever, ever felt so low when you're going to take me out of this black hole. And I'm just like, OK. One, I have not heard this song in so long Two, Yeah, there's some songs that mention black holes. Not black that many. Holes, though. Black hole sun. Yeah, it's the only the, one I can the, think of. This song. Um, there's one other one that I thought of. Oh, uh, Supermassive Black Hole by um by Muse. That was the only other one I could think of. So the timing, man, was was nutty, just really, really nutty. And I, I actually emailed you right away after that because I'm like, this is, this is too, this is too rich. This is a, this is a nice little tickle from the trickster here. Yeah. And yeah, so so I, I don't know what that's evocative of other than that's a fun little synchronicity. But yeah, the, I want. There's a couple things I want to I want to explore a little bit. It just like the idea of a singularity in general. This is like this is a word that gets thrown around a lot. You know, like remember how I'm sure you were into this around like 2012 that there was going to be some kind of singularity, right? Like there like some some uh heightening oh, the of Mayan, consciousness. The Mayan right, calendar. Right, right. Right. Yeah. And that was a word people kept throwing around was like singularity. Like there was going to be some kind of maximum novelty wave, you know, in the Terrence McKennian sense that was going to occur or something. And, and Ray, Kurt, Ray Kurzweil, yeah. the, the historical singularity where technology, the progress becomes exponential. Yeah, yeah singularity. right. Yeah. Yeah. This idea that we would some, we would like somehow hit the limit. It would be kind of like akin to the point on the line graph where the, the line has to almost like start bending backwards because it's just <laughs> breaking all the 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 measurement or whatever um that, that's te that's a super technical it's breaking all the measurement um, <laughs> i feel like donald trump there for a second or something um but anyway yeah this this idea of a singularity what are we really talking about when we say singularity because that's one of those words that i think people have gotten used to hearing but it's mm -hmm. they've gotten used to hearing it so much that they're losing sight of like what it really is well, in physics, the singularity is a point of infinite density. And the thing about, here's another important point that really helps to link the idea of that the singularity and the psyche or the soul are the same thing is, and I learned this from a, a philosophy professor, Robert Bruce Ware. He wrote a book on Hegel. Mm-hmm. And he was equating Hegel's absolute idea, which is synonymous with the idea of the good, yeah. with a gravitational singularity of the Big Bang. He, he quoted this one, the idea is the central point, but it's also the periphery. Um, so Ware pointed out that according to Leibniz's principle of the identity of indiscernibles, so Leibniz, the famous uh, 17th century mathematician who independently discovered calculus at the same time as Newton. He was also a theologian. Monadology was his book. And a monad, according to Leibniz, is very similar to a gravitational singularity. But according to the principle of the identity of indiscernibles, if you cannot discern a difference between two things, they are identical. And 
uh, Robert Bruce Ware pointed out that you cannot tell the difference between two singularities because they're structurally identical. They have no structure. They're a mathematical point. And furthermore, they're all outside of space and time because a point of infinite gravity is equivalent to a point traveling infinitely fast. And if you travel at even the much slower speed of light, you exit space time. So you can't differentiate them by their different locations in the universe. There's a singularity in the center of black holes in the center of every galaxy, strewn throughout the galaxies, miniature black holes in the quantum vacuum. But they're all outside of space time and they're all structurally identical. So they're all one. So they're separate, they're different, and simultaneously they're one thing, which falls in line with the platonic idea of participating in the idea. So if each mm. self participates in the idea of self, then that helps to understand how all the different souls or singularities, although we're separate and unique, we're also all one in some inconceivable way. And before I forget to mention it, the way I see the archetype of the self is that is this, the singularity who can perceive reality through every other singularity simultaneously. Whereas I'm only uh -huh. seeing the world through my perspective and you're probably only seeing the world through your perspective and everyone listening and watching is the same thing. The God archetype, which Carl Jung also called the self, the God archetype, the unus mundus and the one yeah. is experiencing everything you're experiencing, everything I'm experiencing and everything everybody else down to the quantum level, even electrons and the strings to get even more fundamental. And then distilling all of those separate experiences into a unique ego of God's own. That's how I define God. God is everyone. Another, another story I tell often because I think of it frequently is when I got to college, I was taking a class. This was at Boston College, which is a Jesuit school. And this Jesuit priest said, God is you, but you are not God. And the way I interpret that is what I just said. It's like, God is everything that I am, but God is everything that you are, but I'm not everything that you are, at least as a unique individual, we're all one in one sense, Yeah. but that there is such a being. And I know Carl Jung outright it, near the, you know, as he got older was saying, yeah, I believe in God. There's God. I know You're there's right. God. I don't believe. I know that's the famous, what was the BBC interview? Yes. Yeah. I did a whole video on that one too. Yeah. Yeah. So identifying God with this omnicentric singularity, I think helps to just give a, a more of a, of a, a scientific mathematically grounded definition of God and that each singularity contains all of space time is another important point. Wow. At the, at the big bang, all of space and time were contained in the singularity of the big bang. And then the Big Bang explodes. But as you were saying earlier, we experience things passing through time. But from the perspective of the archetypal realm, which exists at the horizon of the cosmos and in the central singularity, there's no passage of time. It's all contained in one point. And if all singularities are identical, then all singularities contain the entire history and future of the universe. So that, and that also supports Socrates' claim that we don't ever learn anything. We just remember things we forgot. Right, right. And, that, and it yeah. all comes back to the mandala of the black hole and the inside out black hole universe. Yeah, re reconciling this idea of self versus oneness, you know, both self existing and some kind of non dual reality presiding over difference is obviously one of the core mind fucks of being a human being that has like a expiration date on itself and now that actually i want to i want to ask you this now that i know that you you checked out the the individuation video jung in the red book specifically in this gnostic mystical work seven sermons to the dead um lays out this idea of individuation for the very first time in this text, it's being talked about by Philemon, who's like his wise man, Senex archetype, and he calls it the Principium Individuationis. And 
one of the things that he says, and again, this like cosmo theological, psychological situation is is laid out here by by the Philemon character. He says that if the principium individuation is, is fulfilled on the part of the individual soul, that soul will become a quote unquote distant star. However, if that soul does not, it will essentially be swallowed by what he calls the pleroma, which is the Greek word for fullness. So sort of sink back into this unity, it almost seems like, which it's like, wait, isn't that sort of what all the mystical traditions are saying is the true reality? And, and not only that, but like it's, it's sort of, from an Eastern perspective at least, the ideal end goal, that you get to cease this game of being a being that's coming in and out of being and suffering and aging and going through all these things and you just get to release back into the all. But Jung, at least here, seems to be presenting like, no, there is some specific reason for the individual and the individual has a goal. And the, the, goal, the, the goal of the individual is individuation. And he puts it in this esoteric terminology of like becoming a distant star. I, I was wondering if you've thought about this and, and what your interpretation of that is, and if that in any way knits into your overall uh, thesis. Oh, yeah. I, I mentioned the pleroma. I use those quotes in the book because they're so perfectly parallel, this idea of information conservation at the horizon of the cosmos. Um, oh, yeah. The seven okay. serv- yeah, the seven servants to the dead. He, he talks about the pleroma is this infinitesimal point in the center and it's also the entire periphery that contains everything um i would read it i'm afraid to click on anything but it's definitely the mandala image is there in the seven sermons Mm -hmm. about the central point in the encompassing sphere and then you mentioned the the principle of individuation that uh you say principium i used to i used to say principium i don't know yeah i don't know I don't know either. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm always butchering the words when I got to uh, the PhD program. I was largely self-taught in Jung and Plato when I got to this graduate program. And, and my professor, Sean Kelly, was just correcting it. Like every word I'd been telling <laughs> myself, I was a little embarrassed to even say anything. I understood the concepts because I'd been reading for so long, but I was... So at any rate, that phrase, the first person I know who used it is Arthur Schopenhauer in the world as will and representation. Mm, mm. And he equated that with Maya, the illusion of the individual, this principle of individuality. And that, you know, there's the Vedanta tradition, there's an atheistic version where you merge the illusion of individual self into Brahman. So Brahman is the ocean of precognitive bliss. It's the potential for all individual form. And then the individual side of the psyche is Atman. And according to Shankara, you merge Atman back into Brahman like a doll made of salt going back to the ocean. Yeah. But then after after, um, Shankara came the Vaishnava reformers, Ramanuja, Madhavacharya, and then Chaitanya at the end of this. And he was the one who said, yes, everything is Brahman and everything is merged. But in some inconceivable way, simultaneously, we're all eternal individual souls, Atman. So we are Atman and Brahman. It's, I see that reflected in the particle wave paradox of quantum mechanics, sure, which is a, yeah. a, whole, a whole nother issue. Um, but obviously, that's important when you talk about Wolfgang Pauli and Carl Jung. But the principle of individuality, is it just an illusion or is it real? I think it's real. I I subscribe to, to Chaitanya's formula, achintya beta beta tattva. That's the Sanskrit slogan for inconceivably simultaneously one and different. Yeah. Which is really non-dual because dualism would say, no, it's dualism. It's not the opposite, but non-dualism would be incorporating the opposite extremes into one. Mm-hmm. But to bring this back to the idea of the pleroma, and individuation, my understanding of Jung's concept of individuation is you spend the first half of your life roughly developing in, you know, fulfilling the demands of society and the species. Right. 
And then after you've met at least the minimum demands, then you withdraw your identity, your sense of self away from your social role and away from your mammalian role and say, I'm not either one of those. So I'm not the, I'm not the archetypes of the collective unconscious. I'm not the role I'm playing in society. And then you re-embrace them in the understanding that everything comes from the archetype of the self which is the archetype of wholeness through the union of opposites. So the self archetype contains everything. It's the idea of the good. It's the source of all being. So you withdraw your identity and then you identify yourself as participating in this archetype of the self. And then that enables you to re-embrace your role in the species and in society so that you're in some inconceivable way simultaneously one with them and di- and different from them and unique. Right. So the principle of individuality, I believe that we are eternal individuals, but I believe that we have to let go of the idea that we are, that our individuality is these temporary material bodies. That's not what we are in the deepest mm-hmm. realm. We are individual selves, but not the ego that identifies itself with a temporary material body. We are a soul. And I'm saying that the mathematical shadow or mirror reflection of that is the gravitational singularity, that we contain all of the information, the past, present, and future of the entire universe. Each of us does, like Socrates said. And the archetype of the self doesn't forget. And the archetype of the mm-hmm. self knows all of the details of our little trajectories through even the material illusion and through this attitude of service to the archetypal self, we can gradually come to remember our true nature and our true function and our true calling, our, our, um, our hero's journey that we have to take. Yeah. I I talk about that. I want to mention this class that I put out immortality and the unreality of death, a hero's journey through philosophy, psychology, and physics how you have to have this hero's journey. Joseph Campbell's famous for making that idea part of the cultural uh, property. Yeah, absolutely. And um, Campbell. this whole idea of individuation, it's the hero's journey. How do you get there? You mentioned earlier how when you first start out on the path of gaining this knowledge, it, you're, it's overwhelming. I remember in college, I would study philosophy. I'm like, this is wonderful. I love this. This is true wealth. I can feel myself becoming wealthier. But then I would get dis- disheartened because I would forget things so quickly. Right. You know, I would yeah. come to a level of realization and then the next day I'd be like, what was I? I was onto something and now I forget. And what I would realize was I'd get a little higher and then I'd fall back, but not all the way back to where I was. And I'd get a little higher and I'd fall back. But each time I'd fall back at a higher level. Right. Yeah. Um, so the process of individuation, it's a painstaking, horrible <laughs> Right. Tragic hero's journey, but um, with guides like Plato and Jung, that that's a great help. And when you have this compass, especially for synchronicities, are huge. To little trail markings down the path of individuation and the mandala image, I see this emergence of the psyche equal singularity equation and the identity of ourselves with the mandala of a black hole or the inside out black hole universe in this time. In history, all points of which exist in the Pleroma, according to Carl Jung and Leonard Susskind, the horizon of the cosmos, but it's accelerating this this sense of an in, of impending doom, but at the same time of impending epiphany, right. and we're being pulled in opposite directions, in so many opposite directions that if Jung was correct, we should expect at the collective scale some kind of compensating mandala imagery to bring wholeness through the union of opposites. And I believe that this idea of the psyche equal singularity and the black hole mandala is that, that it's the self archetype saying to society as a whole, here's the path towards wholeness. Here's the way you're going to get all of these disparate and competing energies focused on the one. And just as it seems to be getting so dark, and the powers yeah. that are against the psyche become so powerful and have such powerful technologies. It's all God's mind. So all the people on that side, they're also <laughs> expressing God's will. 
And I believe that this mandala of the black hole physics and Carl Jung's, you know, it's, it was preordained in the pleroma or the horizon of the cosmos, the collective unconscious mind. And we are experiencing it in this kind of a heroic journey, fighting the forces of darkness. I see this as the bright light. And, and you know, you've dedicated your life to shining this light. And I see you get a lot of good responses. And I think it's because what we need is this. It's satisfying to the soul to, to see this wholeness, this, this light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, it's been, it's, it, it's been a long road for me too. I mean, I, I really, f- there's a lot of similarity in the way that you just described your journey with trying to understand these things. I mean, even a- academically for me, like I only have an, an undergraduate in um, journalism of, I was going to say of all things, but I guess you could construe what I do as journalism somehow, even though yeah. I never held any job in actual journalism. But <laughs> where where I gravitated was actually to philosophy classes and like religious yeah. philosophy classes. And I felt the exact same way. Like I, it was at that moment that something was ignited for me that I didn't feel like any of the standard paths really made sense to acquire what I was thirsting for, but it deepened my curiosity enough to understand that we live in a world that's more complicated than just you either believe in this fairy tale straw man God or you don't and you believe in science. You know, you start to get turned on to these other ideas and you start learning about these other thinkers. And I mean, even people like, you know, I remember even reading, you know, someone who's so core to Western philosophy yet panned in a lot of ways like just reading uh Descartes and his and his meditations um on you know what what I am or what am I not you know you know how does he know he exists how does he know a demon's not controlling his uh just like showing him this false re- like all of these things I mean you just slowly get turned on to these deeper ideas and realize like it's not as simple as you either live in in this binary reality or you don't like there's so many permutations of these ideas there's such a rich rich history and you've got to like follow your nose to understand what you believe where you belong or you just got to turn off that curiosity impulse and just sort of like dissolve back into the cultural pleroba of like of just earning a living and not asking bigger questions and you know ignoring everything until one day you get a like a hey Time's about up for you, my friend. Like, hope, 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 hope yeah. you can make sense of all this in the next however little much time you have till your time's over. <laughs> and, and, and I knew I just could not live that way. And and I remember, like, you know, say what you will about individuation, about coming <laughs> into the world with some kind of identity or fate or purpose. But when I, you know, much like the mandala idea matures, I, I look at my behavior and my obsessions as a younger man, like, you know, whatever job I would have, I would like sneak off to the bathroom and like, you know, watch a, like a spiritual or a philosophical video or like (laughs) right when I first started the podcast years ago, just like constantly obsessing, you know, when I should have been working on, like I had a kind of technical importance, um, it security infrastructure job before this. And I was thinking about the stuff that I'm doing now, like probably 95% of the time that I was supposed to be doing that. So (laughs) say, say what, what, what you will, but that these ways of thinking, these philosophies, you know, what's presented by people like you and what's presented by people like Plato who say that you do come into this world with a directionality, with a fate in a pre-existing ocean of of meaning and you have some kind of role to play. Like these are the only stories that make any of that make any level of sense to me. So those are the, you know, to use a James Hillman phrase, he said, uh, you know, you got to find what tree you're on. Like you got to look around (laughs) you and see who's on the tree. And for me, it's everyone we've been talking about today. It's like Plato's over here. Jung's over here. Hillman's himself is over here. You know, you're you're on this tree, like sitting pretty much right next to me. And knowing <laughs> those things about yourself help immensely to contextualize yourself and what you're doing here. 
So if, if you know if you're curious about these big questions, I would seriously use that as a sort of guidestone. And I, I doubt you've gotten this far in this podcast if you're a materialist atheist, unless you just like to <laughs> like you know just punish yourself <laughs> with ideas that you hate or something. But even if you are, even if you are, you can use the same technique and be like, oh, this is how I orient myself. These are my people. This is how I think. Um, and in a non, I think, yeah, that could sound tribal in some way, but I also think that it's helps you identify who your philosophical family is and what lineage you, you find yourself gravitating toward. And then that gives you an idea of where to go next. Um, and speaking of where to go next, um, <laughs> I want to I want to return to something I almost brought up at the very beginning of the podcast. And unless you have thoughts because I know I've been rambling for quite some time here. Well, two things came to my mind when you were talking. Um one of them was René Descartes who famously created what's called the Cartesian split. He gets right. a lot of bad press as being responsible for the um environmental catastrophe because he said only rational souls, only mm -hmm. rational beings have a soul. Yeah. But what I want to focus on is his definition of a soul. He says there's two types of being. There's unthinking substance extended in space, and that includes animals and plants and then just rocks and inanimate objects. He says animals and plants, they don't have a soul. They, they might seem to be alive, but really they're not because they don't have reason. And then the other side of reality is unextended thinking substance. So by his definition, at any rate, a gravitational singularity would be a thinking substance because it is not extended in space. So a lot of people think to cure the Cartesian split, you know, you reject Rene Descartes, his philosophy. But if we embrace his philosophy of the unextended thinking substance, that matches the psyche equal singularity equation. Hmm. And uh, another thing that I wanted to mention, you, you were saying, you know, what kind of an atheist, a materialist would want to punish themselves? <laughs> It'd be like listening to, you know, someone scraping a chalkboard to hear the two of us yammering on <laughs> from their perspective. Right, yeah. But I would say to them, if you're a mathematical physicist, especially, you, your tradition is also Plato. Right. That if you trace your tradition back to its root, you're going to come back to where we are. And, and as I continuously point out, look at Leonard Susskind. Yeah. Total atheist, the best ally of Platonic philosophy in the history of mathematical physics thus far. I, I, Penrose, just, too. I, Penrose, too. Yeah. Yeah. And Penrose is openly a, a Platonist. Yes. Yeah. But Susskind is openly an anti Platonist. And I believe Susskind's closer to Plato than even the great Roger Penrose. Wow. Accidentally. Yeah. <laughs> And people like Girdle too. I mean, he he's widely considered to be one of, if not the greatest mathematicians of the 20th century. And I mean, he, uh, an ontological proof essentially for the existence of God was found in his notes after he died. So, I mean, I think trying to square Girdle's incompleteness theorem with Platonism is something that's beyond the scope of my intellect, but it's something that I'm, <laughs> I'm, cur I'm curious about because I think that there's, I think that you could spin the argument for that in both ways of like that that sort of in a way disproves the ontological reality of math or something. But I think that I don't think that that's true. I think that that's just highlighting the the limits of the human intellect and our perspective, which would totally make sense if we are situated in a lower projection of a higher reality. Like we're not going to be able from the lower vantage point, the ontologically lower vantage point fully grok that higher ontological level of reality. This is actually something um, I learned about from Professor John Verveke, and I don't remember the name specifically of this, but, um, and he actually got this from another mathematician, Wolfgang something, I can't remember. Okay. So Verveke talks about this as an argument against materialist reductionist thinking because by re materialist reductionist thinking you are saying that we we're going to break reality down into smaller and smaller constituent parts until we get to the fundamental source of whatever it is that makes that thing real however you're in a paradoxical position by saying that because you're assuming the reality of the ruler 
which must exist at a higher ontological level than the thing that it's measuring itself. So if you're trying to get down to the most basic possible bit, you require a higher reality to measure that very thing. So therefore, you're saying the higher thing is just as true, if not truer than the smaller thing. And then you get into this sort of like paradox, right? Um, and I think that in, in a kind of inside out way, that's what we would be looking at with something like Girdle's incompleteness theorem. We're looking at the limitations of our ruler. I guess I'm, I, I guess I just kind of knit those two things together in my mind for the first time now. <laughs> so hopefully that made sense. Um, Hegel, Hegel makes a similar point against Kant. Immanuel Kant said, there's the thing in itself, which you cannot know because all of your knowledge gets filtered through the a priori categories of thought, yeah. especially space, time, and causality. And then Hegel said, what do you mean I can't know reality? I am one with reality, which is more of a platonic thing to say. Yes. And, yes. The, and if, if the tiniest thing you're measuring is a singularity and the measuring ruler you're using is a singularity, then, then it can be done. I <laughs> Yeah, and, wow. you know, for, for Hegel, everything you're observing is just a manifestation of yourself because you are part of God, which he right. says the, you know, the logical manifestation of God is the absolute idea. And then he has all of his categories of God, but it's all about God and history is God. God's self-knowledge is eternal, but we experience it unfolding through time and history. Yeah. But it just is related to this whole idea of can you know the fundamental ground of being? And he was saying, yes, because you are one with it. Right, right. Yeah, and he Hegel actually, I think, provides an interesting addition to this whole thing. And I, we don't even have to, I don't think we have time to get fully into Hegel here, but <laughs> just his idea of, so so to really do a huge injustice bullet point sort of thing to fold him into the conversation. Hegel was hugely influenced by Plato, so you can sort of assume a lot of the backdrop of his philosophy coming from a platonically informed way of thinking about reality in that, you know, there's the, um, it's, is it absolute spirit? Is that what it is? Yeah, he said everything, absolute spirit. The, the absolute spirit, the absolute yeah. idea. But the thing I think that he adds that's interesting that I, maybe isn't explicitly said by Plato, but I think that dovetails nicely into Jung, is that by nature of this, reality is going to continue complexifying and becoming more quote unquote free. And this is an, and this is true, you know, he highlights that throughout human history, you sort of see this happening, like individuals gaining a higher amount of freedom. And there are various bullet points on this journey of um essentially enslavement to freedom like one of the bullet points is socrates and his in his philosophical martyrdom because he's essentially teaching people how to think critically and question for themselves and and gain philosophical freedom so that's a major point for instance but his argument is that and this kind of dovetails in with what you were saying before that it seems like everything is getting more chaotic I'll, i don't remember exactly what you said but you were saying that essentially Everything's getting more chaotic, but more enlightened at the same time. And I think that's what Hegel is saying with this as well, because if you give, if you turn up the dial to the max on freedom, <laughs> you're going to get what looks like chaos, right? Yet for the universe to complete <laughs> its function, it must become maximally free. And then you've sort of done the, you've created the final dialectic, right? Like the, there's been a synthesis and, and an, uh, or, sorry, a thesis, an antithesis, and a synthesis with everything. Like everything has sort of become maximally free and united or something in a way that's probably impossible to attain, sort of similar to Jung's individuation, which is sort of like the individual version of maximizing freedom. You could you could see it in that kind of a way. Yeah, the, I've been, as we were talking earlier before we started recording, I've been focusing on Hegel a lot. I'm working on these papers about AI, artificial intelligence, how that can oh, wow. help us achieve freedom. And Hegel defines freedom, especially in lectures on the philosophy of history, where he talked about the end of history, it was a famous phrase. Mm -hmm. But he said the best way to understand spirit 
So there's God, that's what he says is the ultimate reality. And then God has different manifestations, the primary one being the idea. And then from the idea emerges two more manifestations, spirit and nature. And that's kind of like, I've heard it described, nature would be the thesis and then spirit's the antithesis. And God wants wholeness and he wants to bring unconscious matter back to the realm of consciousness. And he does that through the human species, specifically as they combine themselves into nations and each nation represents a phase of God's process of individuation, the process of God's freedom, which is eternally attained in God, but it manifests temporally here on earth. But he said the best way to understand spirit, which is the goal of history, self-realization is freedom for Hegel, because to obey your own law is freedom. Mm. The laws of, if the laws of the state are based on the laws, like the ideas inscribed on the soul, then you're free because you're only obeying yourself. But the best way to know what spirit is, is to look at its mirror reflection in nature. That's what Hegel says, which is what mm. Pauli and Jung said, which is what Plato said. And then what Hegel added was the idea of gravity because he came after Isaac Newton. And he says, the substance of matter is gravity. And matter is essentially separate parts that are compelled by gravity toward a center outside themselves. Spirit is the opposite of matter. It too is compelled towards a center, but it's compelled toward the center that is itself. And that self-sufficiency is its freedom. Wow. He says matter strives toward a center outside of itself, therefore it strives for its opposite. Mm. But in that same Paragraph, he says, the opposite of matter is spirit. They are mirror opposites. So matter strives for spirit. Spirit is that thing that is, and he does say it's unextended, it's finer than a point. Spirit is a yeah. point that is attracted toward its, toward its own center. Yeah. And matter is attracted toward the center outside of itself, which is spirit. If you, if you interpret that inside a black hole, all of the bits of matter that fall into a black hole are compelled by gravity toward a center outside themselves. They seek their ideal unity. That's what he said. They seek unity. Matter is inherently disparate, but it seeks to become one. If it was to become one, it would become opposite. It would abolish itself. So Hegel's, my, my point is Hegel's philosophy of the absolute idea is also easily correlated with the gravitational singularity. Which shouldn't be surprising if he was genuinely analyzing the ideas in his of his own consciousness, as he said he was, that reason enabled him to do that. So that's another, <clears throat> you know, big, I think using Hegel as a way to bring Jung and Plato into, you know what, what I've been saying is that Jung was focused on the individual, Hegel was focused on nations, but they were both mm -hmm. coming from this platonic perspective. Yeah. And if you combine Hegel and Jung, then you have a more complete uh, unfolding of Plato, who was in the Republic. First, they were looking for justice in the individual soul. And then he says, Socrates says, well, let's, you know, the individual soul is small and hard to see. Maybe if we analyze a perfectly just city-state, yeah. which is bigger, the pattern of the, of the tiny soul will be expanded. It'll be easier for us to see. And then we can go back and see if they do correlate. So I see uniting Hegel and Jung is kind of bringing us back to Plato's Republic. And then, like you said, that could go off to another tangent, but- uh, Good point, good point. Yeah. Is, is it known whether or not Jung read Hegel? I know he had kind of had a distaste for a lot of philosophers, but there were some that he was okay with, but he, he railed pretty hard against certain philosophers. But, but I believe, I mean, he used, Hegel, Hegel's the one who, originated zeitgeist right i don't know if he originated it but i wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me yeah because i and jung jung used like you know spirit of the depth spirit of the times like he he used very similar ideas like the like the idea of almost like s collective psyches of nations of times of of all these different things and that seems very hegelian to me and, unless i'm confusing that with someone else no it is definitely hegelian that each faith 
So the the uh, the chair of my dissertation committee was Sean Kelly, mm-hmm. who, who still teaches at the California Institute of Integral Studies in the Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness program, the PCC program. He wrote a book called, um, <clears throat> was it Hegel, Jung, and Individuation? Shoot, I should. Oh wow. Read. Yeah, so that's a great resource where he's talks about all of this. He's a Jung scholar and a Hegelian. Those are his two specialties. And Jung did rail against Hegel and he said, oh, you know, you go off in this word salads. And, uh, but he had some good things to say about him also. But, um, so Sean Kelly says, no, they're much more alike. They're much more aligned than Jung believed they were. And, and I'm focusing on that now. And I think the two together makes more of a, of a complete, you know, uh, whitehead said, yeah, yeah, yeah. The safest generalization of European history of philosophy is that everything's a footnote to Plato, yeah. something basically like that. Mm-hmm. I think the, the three footnotes to Plato that I'm focusing on is Jung, Hegel, and Leonard Susskind's holographic string theory. And when you put those three together, I think that's a, um, an indomitable, trifecta, even despite yeah. Susskind. I, I believe Susskind's atheism makes it so much stronger. I, I see that as God's plan because uh-huh. you can trust that his information isn't bending itself into pretzels to support some kind of a mystical right, worldview right, right, because right. he's doing, if anything, the opposite. Yeah. And the fact that he unconsciously pulled up this math that so perfectly fulfills what Plato predicted and so perfectly synthesizes with what Jung and, and, and Hegel also are describing makes it that much more believable. Um, and that's part of the zeitgeist, the, the, the spirit of our times. And, and so Hegel said the end of history, it's not when time stops, but it's when a state has achieved freedom or what Jung would call individuation. Yeah. Yeah. And I believe, and, you know, Jung's individuation, it's you're guided there by mandala symbols. So a nation that could be guided by this mandala of the inside out black hole model of the psyche would be a free state. If the laws were based on the realization that the absolute ideas like equality and justice are out at the horizon of the cosmos, literally, and if that could be demonstrated logically and reasonably, and the laws could be traced back to these archetypes. And I believe artificial intelligence like chat GPT-4 can help us see these mirror symmetries and unfold the philosophical and political implications. If a legal system could be based on that realization, that would be a free state according to Hegel's philosophy. Wow. And that would be an individuated nation. It would be the individual has individuation, the nation strives for freedom, I believe that's where we're headed. That's the convergence point. That would be the end of history, which would really be the beginning of a kind of a golden age of a just world. (laughs) Yeah. But then again, how do aliens fit into all of this? I'm kind of kidding. I'm kind of kidding. That's the the Vedanta tradition totally believes in aliens. They talk all Perfect. about every every planet has a is presided over by a demigod, and there's all kinds of species. So I mean, <laughs> I don't know. Right. How, yeah. No, I yeah, I, I was I was joking. I was I was mainly joking. I, I I think I just thought to myself, I think we've covered everything that I love to cover in these mind melts, except <laughs> we haven't talked about whatever's going on with the uh, the UFO phenomenon yet. But but yeah, to your point, I mean there's plenty of room in Plato and Western esotericism for, for beings as well, like whole classes of beings. De- oh yeah. You know, di- daimones, like various classes of gods and yeah. Yeah. Um, man, I would love to open the can of worms that I started opening with you at the beginning of this talking about, um, Dr. Donald Hoffman. I can't, be- I'm actually really surprised you haven't, uh, stumbled across his work yet, but maybe, maybe we can, reconvene on that the next time because i think you i think he and you definitely have like i said a different bit of a different angle of attack he is a cognitive scientist who spent his um career studying perception but he essentially believes that 
um, through the senses, we perceive 0% of reality, <laughs> that the senses are merely an evolutionary fitness payoff mechanism. So they're designed to keep us alive, keep us, um, you know, procreating, keep us safe, but they don't tell us anything about reality. And to actually learn anything about reality, well, for, first of all, consciousness is fundamental in his in his worldview. He he is something of an idealist, but he believes through math and through science you can eventually arrive at whatever reality truly is. But so far, we have not done that whatsoever. We've done what is akin to kind of exploring the wall, the shadows on the walls of Plato's cave. We we have not really gotten outside the ultimate cave into the more real reality of whatever consciousness is. And what's crazy is this is not just philosophical ideas for him. Like he's actually looking at um, cutting edge physics and he's trying to make a model of consciousness that fits in a mathematically precise way with where physics is going. So he doesn't believe any of the models that we currently have are correct. Like they're all at best kind of partially describing some features, but are ultimately doomed. Like one of his favorite things to say is that space time is doomed. <laughs> um, but he gets into stuff that I do not understand at all in terms of like what their true relevance is. Um, and I'm sorry, I said I wouldn't open this can of worms and I'm fully <laughs> opening it now. And it just, it, it just excites me. Um, <laughs> But um, there's there's essentially this new field of physics emerging due to particle physics, where they're finding these what they what are called deep structures. So things like the amplitudehedron are are one of them. I like um, the sound of that. <laughs> right. So so what it boils down to is that something that looks like a polytope, so something that looks like a platonic solid, basically predicts more about the collisions of um, particles at the Large Hedron Collider than all of our mathematical models do, or at least without like crunching a phone book thick thing of mathematical terms. Like that that's our old math versus this new math they've discovered that like all um, can be captured on one shape, basically. And you can do on one piece of paper versus like a phone book's worth of supercomputer number crunching. Yeah. So, yeah. So so that this is, I, I won't go any further because we're at like nearly the two hour mark here. And I know I know you've got to wrap up relatively soon. But um, maybe I, if I've you- been going down this rabbit hole in my conversations with Chad GPT. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to, because the platonic solids from the Timaeus, the five perfectly symmetrical shapes, and then you've got the higher dimensional perfectly symmetrical shapes, like the, um, what do they call the, the, the four dimensional cube, the tesseract. Oh, right. Know? Yeah, yeah. And so then when you have higher dimensional geometry, where you get into Riemannian geometry, and I just have, I get the feeling it's going to be something like what you're talking about. Um, I was trying to correlate the five regimes in Plato's Republic with the five platonic solids to see if there's some kind of a, oh yeah. Oh a, yeah. A trick that Plato was using or, but at any rate, when you started talking about that, that's what I was like, what's, what's the one shape that all the other platonic shapes can be turned into that contains them all. Is there some higher dimensional platonic solid? Yeah. You know, and, but that's just, I have been thinking about yeah. that too, without any kind of, uh, I mean, I understand what the uh, imaginary unit is, the square root of negative one, which is this great mystical number that's key to the higher dimensional geometry, but uh, that's pushing the absolute limits of yeah. my mathematical capacity. Well, maybe maybe I can send you down some rabbit holes and we can re reconvene on them uh, another time. Yeah, sure. All right, my friend. Well, let's let's wrap this one up. Really okay. looking forward to also diving into your your book more deeply. This has been a super fun conversation. Oh yeah. And if there's anything other than the book you want to point people toward, just uh, feel free to let them know. Yeah. Well, there's the book, Psyche and Singularity, Jungian Psychology and Holographic String Theory. And then most recently, 
I created a class that's basically a breakdown of the book with slides and words, and then I explain them. But the focus is on the hero's journey, like I mentioned earlier, and how the psyche equals singularity equation can help us take this hero's journey into the underworld, the land of the dead, and then come back with the boon to save civilization. And I incorporate this, the new era of AI, how AI, some people say, is it's the monster that's going to destroy the human species, but it can also be the tool that we use to save us. It could be the, so the land of the dead, I call the horizon of the cosmos where Jung had his near death experience. If we can Mm -hmm. go out there and come back with this knowledge of our unity with the central singularity in the horizon of the cosmos, that's, and bring that to society. And I bring in Hegel, like I mentioned earlier. So that's kind of this uh, modern hero's journey that incorporates the things that we've talked about. Love it. Let's do it again. Okay. Can't wait to put this one out.